That was about 15 minutes worth. We need Good morning, ten, everyone. We need a 10-year-old among us because mm -hmm. they're well, so savvy. Christy's supposed to be doing this, but she doesn't like getting up and down, so. That's not true. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are here for our study of, I guess what you'd say is everything else. But we're not going to study everything else. We're, we're uh, exclusively going to look at the New Testament letters. Uh, the biggest portions of this last 24% of the biblical literature is comprised of the stating of the law in the Old Testament and these letters from the New Testament. They're, they're just different kind of literature. You know from your study of Old Testament that you'll come upon huge sections where it's just one law after another. Uh, they're not poetry, they're not narrative, they're something else. They're, they're the statement of the law. Uh, likewise, these letters from the New Testament are not narrative in some ways Reading a letter in the New Testament is like looking at a really old Bob Newhart routine. I don't know if you remember when he first came out, but his claim to fame were the phone calls where you would only hear his end of the phone call. And that's kind of the way these letters are. They oftentimes do address important issues within a congregation but they may, those issues may not be stated, and we only can guess at what they were by what Paul has written back to the church. Um, and, and let me say a prayer before I go any further. Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity again to look at the types of biblical literature which we will encounter in our study, whatever we're studying. So help us to discern from knowing more about the literature itself, what the literature is trying to tell us. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 So let me pick right up there if I can reconstruct my thoughts. Um, Paul doesn't always tell us what the problems are, and we have to guess at them somewhat by what he has written. One of the things that I think it's really important for us to remember is we rely on so much, uh, well, we rely on theologians throughout the history of the church uh, for understanding of biblical study. By the way, I love to do this too. Uh, I'm just going down one rabbit hole after another. Uh, theologian always sounds like an intimidating word. But I am here to tell you this morning, you are a theologian and I can prove it very quickly. Have you ever read the Bible? Mm -hmm. You have. Okay. In reading the Bible, did it cause you to have thoughts about God? Mm -hmm. Then you're a theologian. It's the study of God. Theo. What is Theo? In God. God. Yes, my Theology God. is the study, the study of. of. So if you've ever read the Bible and had a thought about God afterwards, you're a theologian. And, and, and that is a good thing because mm -hmm. it means you didn't just, um, um, you jumped in the water and you didn't just take a boat over it, as we said in the sermon a few weeks ago. Um, and that, that's always a good thing. Now, in these letters, Paul was not really sitting down to say, what theological uh, element can I write about today? What important theological idea can I convey to this church? What he did was, he said, oh, I heard from the Romans and they said this, or I heard from Thessalonians and they said that, and I need to write something to try and direct them back in the right path or to affirm that what they're doing is good. You know, he, uh, he was responding to problems. Um, it just so happens that by doing that, he does give us the building blocks and certainly the foundation of our Christian theology. Now, that doesn't mean we always like it. Uh, we may not like some of the things he has to say. Um, the other thing you have to remember, and, and it's funny, I've told you time and time again not to draw out single lines, but here's one you need to remember. You remember where Paul writes, I try to be, or he says, I am all things to all people. 
What does that tell us about Paul? That he was human, that he was, he was looking to redeem himself in so many different ways. Well, I think what it says is I'm smart enough not to go into a church and just purposely pick a fight right off the bat. <laughs> and so I'm going to find common ground with that person, even if there are areas where we disagree. I'm not going to start there. I'm going to start with, well, let's talk about what we agree about. And that, what I find interesting about that is I wish more people would do that. Mm -hmm. Too often, not just in theology, politics, you name it. People go in, the first thing they try and look for is the things that make us different. Mm -hmm. If you go in and look at the things that we have in common and establish relationships, you're so much better off because you are less likely to forgive a stranger than you are a friend. If someone is your friend and they say something you don't agree with, you're, you're not immediately going to demonize them. That's my opinion. And so... Um, we're going to take a brief look at these letters today, and on top of the fact that we have way too much material to cover, we have two videos, but they are both very important. One of them talks about the, the um, trying to understand the cultural context in which these letters are written, and that is incredibly important because if you don't, Paul ends up saying some things that are really, we would not agree with immediately like his attitude towards women but that was a cultural thing mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. in in this culture you were a wife you were a mother or you were somebody's child that's your choice of identities um not not that there weren't some outliers there's always outliers in every in every culture but um in in this case uh, th those were the pr three primary roles which women played. He also basically seems to at least tacitly agree with slavery. Now, I know you can find examples, especially uh, Philemon or Philemon, however you want to pronounce that, um, where he doesn't, he, he seems to not do that so much. But um, let's face it, this is a culture where there were slaves. Well, we don't live in that culture anymore. So you have to discount all those um, statements right off the bat. Um, but much of what he says is still applicable, at, certainly at a very basic theological way. So um, let me get us started on this part. In the New Testament, there are 21 letters written by early Christian leaders to communities of Jesus' followers in the ancient Roman world. A wise reading of these letters involves learning about their historical and literary context. Now, I have probably just pulled up. I may have pulled up the wrong video, but either way, we'll get them both in. All right. The New Testament has a large collection of ancient letters from the circle of the apostles. Paul wrote 13 letters to seven church communities. Peter, of course, is credited with 1st and 2nd Peter, which we, um, and John is credited with 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Um, those, along with James and Jude, are oftentimes considered what we call the Catholic letters. We don't know exactly, Catholic meaning church universal. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly who they're addressed to. We don't know exactly what the situation is that they are addressing. They are not like Paul who immediately tells us, I'm writing this letter to. Uh, the, the last of them, of course, is Hebrews. And the interesting thing about the letter to the Hebrews or the book of Hebrews is um, not that it doesn't have elements of a letter, but it is really more like an essay. 
It's like someone has, has the, the, of all the letters, that's the one that seems most like a theological statement. And uh, take, for what, take that for what you will. Uh, yes. Do it. Who wrote Hebrews? Do we know? Well, for for a millennia, we credit it to Paul. It, Hebrews is the first letter that was credited to Paul that people began to say Paul didn't write this. And you know, still, if, I, if you've got a King James Bible, it still probably says Paul's letter to the Hebrews. So I mean, it's not like these things are universal. However, um, one, and this is again a cultural context, Let's make sure this doesn't go away. Um, these days, we have a huge problem with, um, oh gosh, the word just went away from me. When, when you take something from somebody else, plagiarism. We have a huge problem with plagiarism. We, we are just, you know, well, you could say that there are times, there are probably times in this literature where you maybe would have reverse plagiarism. In other words, something is credited to Paul that may not have been written by Paul, but when I say, Paul, your ears perk up, you're going to listen. And that's what they were doing in that thought process. Um, there are probably elements, maybe not of all the letters, but of some of them, where the, the uh, scribe can certainly be credited, the scribe that wrote the letter to begin with, with some of the ways things are phrased at the very least. And at the very most, students of Paul, uh, some of these people that he names, may have added things from their own understanding, you know, well, he didn't say such and such this time, but I've heard him say it before. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Um, but they weren't—they were not concerned with that kind of um, cr cr uh, crediting of who exactly said what. You got four gospels; they give us all sorts of quotes from Jesus, but nobody was taking notes when Jesus was preaching. It's all from memory. And that's why I said, and these stories, these parables especially, tying up, Jesus said them more than once. Um, same is true of my preaching, isn't it? I find a good illustration I like. It's liable to get repeated, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It might be repeated yeah. for 20 years, but that's okay. I laugh. Well, I don't let them go. If it, if it makes a point clearly, I keep hold of those things. Sure. So anyway. Um, letters from the apostles fan of the Bible were not written as timeless abstract essays on theology and ethics. They're real letters with real audiences for particular purposes in response to specific situations. Okay, before we go any further, let's go ahead and, and oh, get up and turn this off. Near the end of the Bible are 21 letters from leaders of the early Jesus movement. They were written to small church communities in cities throughout the Roman world. Now, writing letters took a lot of money and effort in the ancient world, and so each one was crafted carefully from beginning to end. And that means we should read them as one whole literary work. So let's talk about how to read New Testament letters in their literary context. Of all the early Christian leaders, the Apostle Paul wrote the most letters. We have 13 in the New Testament. I often imagine him alone in his study, writing long theological essays. But Paul didn't work or write alone. In fact, he often names people from his team who helped him produce the letters. Oh, right, like Timothy or Silas. Yeah, Paul was constantly with his missionary teammates, on the road working out ideas as they talked and debated and taught together. And Paul would have collected speeches, poems, and prayers in notebooks. Like the ones he mentions in his second letter to Timothy. Right, and so Paul would get the right teammates in a room and start pulling together old and new material. Then they would hire a professional scribe and start creating drafts until they were satisfied with how it worked together as one whole. Then mail it off. 
Yeah, the letter would be given to a trusted teammate who would also be given instructions on how to perform it before the recipients. Perform it like read it aloud? Yeah, most people back then didn't read. And so Paul mentions this more than once in his letters that they were designed to be heard, which is why they often sound like written speeches. So it's important for us to read and listen to these letters from beginning to end, too, so we can appreciate how each part contributes to the whole. Exactly. Now, every culture has its own practice for how to organize a letter, and in the first century, there was a standard format. You have the opening, which names the author and then the receiver. Then a prayer of thanks or a greeting. Then comes the body of the letter. This part is the main reason for writing in the first place, what the receiver is supposed to know or do something about. Right. And then comes the conclusion, which could have greetings, travel plans, a final request, or a prayer. So it's helpful to see how a New Testament letter breaks down into these parts. Right. So let's take, for example, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Okay. There's the opening. And then a long thanksgiving prayer to God. And in the center of this opening prayer, Paul introduces the main idea of the whole letter. It's about God's plan. To unite together all things in heaven and earth, in Messiah Jesus. But what does that mean? Well, as we move into the body of the letter, Paul is going to repeat and unpack this rich idea. Right. But in the body of the letter, it's easy to get lost and lose track of what Paul's even talking about. Totally. I mean, the letter to the Ephesians has about 3,000 words. And that one's short compared to his other letters. But remember, Paul wrote these letters to be heard aloud. And so he usually gives clues to the progression of thought with transition words like therefore or because of this or so then. Okay. So the body of Ephesians breaks down to a lot of paragraphs, but they all begin with these transition words. Right. And each paragraph has its own main idea. So the first one is about how the risen Jesus is king of everything and everyone. And as for you, that is non-Israelites, you are now included in the new humanity God's creating. Therefore, God's one new family consists of people from all nations. So God has unified a new humanity in Jesus. That's the core idea here. Right, and that theme unites all of the paragraphs in chapters 1 through 3. Then we come to chapter 4 and we get a really significant transition. Therefore. Yeah, that transition word is actually a hinge between the first and second half of the letter. God's unified a new humanity in Jesus. Therefore what? Great question. Let's keep going and we'll summarize the paragraphs of chapter 4. God's one new humanity is really diverse, so we must live together as God's new creation. And that, therefore, requires that we learn how to love and forgive each other because we are one. This section is all about living in unity. Right, and so you can see now how all the parts of the letter fit together into one flow of thought. God's unified a new humanity in Jesus, therefore live in a way that fosters that unity. Seeing it broken down like this is really helpful. It's like a roadmap, so I don't get lost. Right, and you can read every New Testament letter this way. Break it down into smaller parts to see the message of each paragraph. And then trace repeated ideas and transition words to see how they all connect back together. Then you'll see how the apostles brilliantly combined all of the pieces into a literary whole that spoke to Jesus' first followers and can still speak to us today. She likes modern art. I, on the other hand, like impressionism. Me too. I love <laughs> impressions. I like that too. The pointillism and all that good stuff. Yeah. All right. So, um, that the, the the points that they were making in that video served as a good guide to all the all the, the letters certainly again except maybe for hebrews which someone has tried to make it look like a letter we're guessing that's probably a later editor um it, it feels more like an essay it feels more like it has been written as theological statements 
uh, for Hebrews about Christianity, mm -hmm. trying to tap into to showing them how um, the, the Hebrew the elements of the Hebrew faith have transitioned right into the Christian faith, but we, we're not going to spend a ton of time on that. Um, but then again, of course, each letter is different. Some of them sound similar. Uh, sometimes it seems like they are dealing with the same subject. And indeed, um, and I can't remember right offhand what the order is, but there are three different of Paul's letters that they, and three major of his letters that basically sound like he's refining the same idea until he, he got it to where he wanted it. Um, so, what do the New Testament, or excuse me, where do the New Testament letters fit within the narrative of the larger biblical story? Well, they're trying to show us the context of Christianity in the early years of the church. Um, you, you, I guess you could just read the book of Acts and say, that's as much as I need to know about the history of the church. Um, but the letters in many ways serve as, and, and don't misunderstand this phrase, secondary sources for getting the history of the early church because in hearing what it was they were dealing with, we know more fully about what these churches were like and indeed what the church in general was like. It was a, a way, it, it is a way of us unpacking uh, more intimately in some ways, certainly than the book of Acts does. Uh, the, the book of Acts at times is, is more like a travelogue, and it certainly is not in the same type of literature. It's narrative. It's very much narrative, uh, whereas these, as we point out, are a different kind of literature. Uh, they certainly help us to understand the cultural context. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, um, how many different cultures, I'm not talking about the locales, but what are the main cultures we're encountering when we read the letters of any, any of the persons that wrote them? We're encountering the Greco-Roman, which obviously was all over the world at that point. And you have believers who have absolutely no religious background other than what they have picked up in either Greek or Roman or the, or the combination of the two uh, culture. Now, we've read enough of the, that kind of stuff when we were in school that we, we have some idea of what it's like. It's not like Christianity, is it? It's not like Judaism, is it? And for one thing, it, uh, it, it, it uh, portrays a, a faith world where there are multiple gods. All right, well, the other half of the, the uh, cocktail here is the Jewish culture which is monotheistic and which uh, in which we find um, all sorts of references which Jesus and others uh, refer to in, in the um, in the um, books of the Bible but they are not all there is and especially when Paul is writing these churches, what we, which culture will you find in those churches? Both. Because usually when he came to town and started a church, where did he go? Synagogue. And he'd get enough of those people mad at him that they'd throw him out. Mm -hmm. Then he started preaching to what um, th they would have uh, seen a as non-believers. But Paul knew they had religious understanding it just wasn't what the jews were used to they weren't heretics they were just different kinds of believers it's kind of like uh, you're here in, in the united states mm -hmm. you've got northerners you've got southerners you've got westerners mm -hmm. you got mountain people you got valley people and it's, it's each culture is different right and when you come from the south go up north you have to learn a whole new set of of uh, cultural mm -hmm. you know, things that you've got to watch out for. Yeah. And uh, I think that's the same thing there because it, it just wasn't centered around uh, 
Jerusalem, mm -hmm. centered around Judas, uh, the it, it was everywhere. I, except the one problem they had was with Asia. Hmm. You know, and the Holy Spirit actually at one time said, "No, you don't go to Asia." <laughs> you know, and <laughs> yeah. says that's that's not a good thing to, to go. Yes, with. and some of them found that out the hard way. It, it was not the time nor place right. at that point. Right. Okay, so you got multiple cultures within these letters. You also have the situational context. What is the relationship of the author and the audience? The situational context of the house churches that provides the backstory of a letter's occasion, purpose, motivation, and therefore informs the interpretation of the letter's context. Content, excuse me. He was not dealing with cookie cutter Christians. They are all different. We should understand that better than anybody. Because when you come into a town like Newburn, what do you see? Bunches of churches. Well, at this point in time, there was only one church in town. Everybody belonged to it. That's not true here. And you can find any style of worship, any style of theology, any, any style of whatever that you're looking for in a town, certainly of this size. There's just all sorts of things. Well, there, it was one group. But they still were different. They were different from one another. They were different from the people around them. They had had a different start. And they were certainly at different places theologically. Paul understood that early on. And again, he said, I am all things to all people. Because you've got to find a way to relate to everyone. Uh, the literary context of the entire letter as a unified act of ancient epistolary communication. I didn't want to fall through that one. <laughs> the letters must be read in light of the conversation realities of ancient letter writing and every single part of a letter must be understood in light of its function while developing the argument. And again, we cannot always be sure 100% uh, exactly what it is he's responding to because sometimes, you know, and you, you know this from your own personal relationships, Someone will come to you, and they'll tell you something. And when you respond, they may be confused because it sounds like you're not responding at all to what they've told you, but you know them. You may know the other folks, and you're responding in such a way to try and en enlarge the argument. It's not just about issue X. It's X, Y, Z. And there may be some A, B, C in there. And people need to understand that at times, that um, what, they, what they may be mad about is not what they're mad about. Does that make sense? Um, they, they've just chosen to find this. Um, we are running a little late. Let's see. Um, yeah, I know. Bottom line. This is what I was looking for. The apostles' letters represent the announcement and teaching of King Jesus given to specific local house churches living in the Greek and Roman worlds. We inhabit the same spot in the biblical story as the original recipients, but we live in a vastly different cultural setting. This means we must provide cross-cultural translation of the apostles' teaching into our own multicultural context. We have, we have each, me, start with me and y'all can get in a line behind me, read these letters, come to an understanding of what they mean, and at some point... Um, ignorantly said, well, I would never get confused about something like that. And then, uh, as Jesus would say, we, we see the speck in our brother's eye and miss the log in our own eye. Um, we, we get caught in our own stupid misunderstandings of things. And uh, do not 
do not think of these people as simple or uh, ignorant. They were not. Um, this business of, you know, of eating meat that had been sacrificed in a, in a um, pagan temple. You know, we have our own understandings that we, we start drawing lines in the sand and saying, you can't go over this. And immediately somebody says, well, yes, I can, because don't you remember Jesus said, and, and they have their own, could you get those? Yes. They have their own understanding of what it is that Jesus is saying and meaning. And so um, we, we just have to we just have to take it uh, for uh, granted mm -hmm. that if we think they have um, thank you. Con contact, thank you honey, very much, uh, of misunderstandings of what Jesus is saying, then we do too. We we most certainly do, and uh, um, it is never as simple as it seems. It is never as simple as it seems. All right. Well, uh, before I say anything about this other, I'm going to go ahead and play the historical context for you. And that way we'll have seen that one. And then we'll jump back into this. Do you have a question? Yes. Go right ahead. Um, these churches, I don't know, were they a body of people prior to Jesus that were worshiping Baal or whatever, or did they form because of Jesus? I mean, the, they may not have ever met him, but they heard about him, and so they got okay. together and whatever. Again, the churches that Paul's writing to are, I would say, exclusively composed of people who uh, had no understanding of Judaism and people whose only understanding had been Judaism. And so that right there, you've got two very diverse groups trying to come together now in one single group. But no, they, they, would, not, they would not have been understanders of those religions because those are Middle Eastern religions. The kind of thing they're familiar with is... Um, and I suddenly cannot think of the names of the gods, but uh, the, the gods that uh, the Greeks and then, of course, the Romans incorporated into their understanding, uh, they were also followers of philosophies. They might not believe in the old gods. They might think of them as being e as, as entertaining as you and I do of that kind of literature now. But they had philosophical understandings which they thought, which they would have thought of in the same terms of religion. Stoicism, um, Epicureans, uh, th these philosophies which we know the names of, we don't really fully understand. But uh, that, that is what the churches are composed of. People with those kinds of backgrounds, either ph philosophical or uh, the stories of the Greek and Roman gods and Jews. And it makes for an interesting mix because, um, and all sorts of problems. You know, the Jewish believers think, well, you probably, there was one of the controversies was these people that we're meeting with ought to become Jews so that they can become Christians. And Paul was immediately averse. They, you know, no, you know, they, they don't have to go, you know, backwards, let's all go forward, was kind of his thought. Near the end of the Bible are 21 letters written to communities of Jesus' followers throughout the ancient Roman Empire. Letters? Like, I'm reading someone's mail. Yeah. The letters are written by the apostles, that is, the people that Jesus appointed to spread the good news about his kingdom. And they wrote to Jesus' followers living in different cities around the Roman world. These letters were all written in a style called prose discourse. Now, if I'm reading a letter that wasn't written to me, then there's likely a lot of background information that's assumed but not mentioned. Yeah, exactly. And the letters in the Bible are no different. Okay, so let's talk about how to read the New Testament letters in historical context.
So there are three levels of historical context to keep in mind when reading the New Testament letters. The first is how all the letters fit into the larger storyline of the scriptures. Right, so this story begins with God creating humanity as his partners to rule creation with him. But we choose to rule on our own terms, leading to violence, exile, and death. But God promises a guy named Abraham that life and blessing will spread to all nations through him and his descendants to renew God's vision for humanity. And Jesus said he came to bring that promise to its fulfillment through his life, death, and resurrection. Right, and so the apostles saw themselves as heralds announcing the arrival of God's kingdom in Jesus. Like the apostle Paul. When he wrote to the house churches in Rome about the good news, he said his job was to summon people of all nations to give their allegiance to Jesus, the exalted king of the world. That's a bold thing to say to people living in the capital city of the Roman Empire whose allegiance is supposed to be to Caesar. Yeah, and that actually brings us to the second important context for understanding the New Testament letters, the culture of the Roman Empire in the first century. So Rome ruled all of these territories around the Mediterranean Sea. And they built their empire by conquering and enslaving their enemies and then imposing heavy taxes. The emperor and his small circle controlled all of the power and wealth, and they knew how to deal with people who threatened the social order. Most people lived without much money or stability. And Roman culture had a very clear hierarchy. Men from important families with money and education could move ahead in society. But women, slaves, children, and the poor were always at a disadvantage and treated as inferior. Yet, in a community of people who followed Jesus, everyone was treated with love and equal dignity. Yeah, in Roman life, it was unheard of for people of high status to associate with people below them. But the apostles said that through Jesus, God had given the gift of his love to everyone without regard to their status. So in that context, these letters were countercultural and they broke down barriers between people. Exactly. And so that brings us to the last level of context, the situational context of each letter. You mean the specific issues in the church of a city that prompted the writing of the letter in the first place? Yeah, like Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome. It's tempting to read this letter and focus on all the important theology and then overlook why he wrote this letter. Why did he write it? Well, towards the end, he talks about how Jewish food laws and sacred days have become controversial between Jewish and non-Jewish followers of Jesus. Which was creating divisions in the church. And if you read carefully, you can see that some Christians with higher social status were treating Jewish followers of Jesus with contempt. And Jewish Christians were returning the favor, condemning the non-Jews as second-rate followers of Jesus. Exactly. And so all of the ideas and theology in the first part of the letter were crafted to address those very problems. Paul acknowledges that the Roman Christians have big differences in culture, theology, and social status, but he wants them to realize that they are unified by their faith in Jesus, who is the real center of their church. Okay, great. But if that letter was written to someone else, then what should I get out of it? I mean, I don't live in ancient Rome. Well, in these letters, we see the apostles challenging and transforming every part of their first century culture and life with the good news about King Jesus. And by watching them, we gain wisdom about how that same good news can transform our culture as well. Now, there's one more helpful step to take in reading the New Testament letters, and that's learning how to follow the flow of thought from the letter's beginning all the way to its end. And that's what we'll look at next. There we go. Okay. So. Obviously, uh, most of us are not, well, I shouldn't say that. A lot of people are fond of history, but nobody's fond of, well, anyway. One of the things that, that is important to keep in mind 
is the context of where these things are being written. As they point out, it's in a Roman world. And you have to know at least a little bit about what all that would mean. We, we have some concept of it by reading the Gospels where it becomes obvious that it's, it's a Roman world. But um, we, um, I think, tend to lose maybe some of that perspective when we look at the letters and especially when we only look at portions of a particular letter. So um, as they point out, the best way to approach any of these letters is to always read them all the way through. For the most part, they're relatively short, and so that's not a problem. Uh, when we pick out pieces, we're liable to miss the fullness of the argument. Um, and, and the example that I, I like to use is, it's like uh, when someone gives a, a 30 minute speech or whatever, and then what you see later on the news are four sentences that have been picked out. You know, I don't know what context they were said in or what followed up behind them. Um, I might be able to guess, uh, but you know what guessing will get you. And uh, so if we, if we just take sentences uh, out of the letters, we're, we're liable to, to miss. Um, we might not misconstrue them but we might miss the full importance of them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. In other words, yeah. uh, they're really saying even more than we think they are mm -hmm. um, with, when you give them their usual buildup. Um, the, po the point that they made in there in the video that I want to reinforce is the idea of honor and shame in the Greco-Roman world because um, we have our own version of that. We just call it money. But, but they had these understandings of some people were more important than other people, and therefore you treated them that way, and, and that's just the way life was. And Jesus is coming and saying, no, that's not the way that life is. And Paul and the other missionaries are reinforcing that. And so the ch early church now... The early church was mostly composed of people who we would say were the people without, the, the have-nots. Mm. But there were some haves. And the longer the church existed, the more haves became a part of it, all the way up to the point where Constantine makes the uh, Christianity the f faith of the state. So... Um, it was important that they realize from the get-go that the way society valued people was not the way the church valued people. It certainly was not the way God valued people. When, God, when Jesus says that all people are God's children, that's a mighty powerful statement. I like the way he says it in the video, he describes it as being a subversive statement. Well, I, you know, I guess maybe being a Christian my entire life, I don't think of it that way, but in some ways it is because we still have large, if not all segments of our um, society, which value people for what they've got. And so-and-so is very important because, you know, they, they have a lot of possessions or they, they have a lot of power, however you would define that. And those people aren't any more important than the folks that um, don't have anything and are reminded of that constantly. Um, the truth is we're all lost, the lost lamb. We may think we're not lost because we've got a house and we've got a vehicles and we've got a savings account, but we are. We, we are just as lost as those who are living on the street and 
have no idea what tomorrow will bring and are totally dependent upon the weather to either keep them warm or, or not. Um, it, it's just, uh, we are all God's children. Anyway. Then, of course, there's honor and shame, uh, and this is really just the other half of what I was saying. Early Christians were persecuted. A uh, religious minority whose founding figure was disgraced and shamefully executed as a criminal by the Roman state. What we see in the New Testament letters is a reframing of the meaning of Jesus' death as an act of courage and self-giving generosity, therefore showing it honorable. And of course, I think we all have an understanding of that. We, we certainly as Christians, uh, but we, we have a much better understanding of that point uh, as Christians, or at least familiar with Christianity, than a culture that did not. Um, Jesus had been... Um, Persecuted is a powerful word, but he had been persecuted by the religious hierarchy of the temple. And so, you know, the Jews were against him, is one way of saying it. The, the Romans had persecuted him uh, at the behest of these Jews, but also in some ways uh, seeing him as a threatening political figure. And so... Um, you know, why would we listen to this guy? He's the son of God. And they, they reframe what um, standard thinking of the day would be. You know, if, if I told you someone had been um, uh, convicted of a capital punishment crime, you automatically have thoughts about that person. Well, Jesus was convicted of a capital punishment crime. But that's not the way the church understood him. That's not the way we understand him. And so we've totally reframed the understanding of who Jesus is. Uh, and it brings a, a, a more real meaning to him saying, take up your cross and follow me. Because just what they did to me could happen to you. Maybe in a hugely realistic way, of all the martyrs for the church and maybe in a, a more uh, psychological way of, you know, oh, surely you don't believe those fairy tales. Oh, surely you're smart enough to realize everybody's out for themselves. <laughs> oh, surely you know that you've just got to garner everything you can get because that's what really gives value to who you are. And we, we say no to all that. Um, you cannot understand these letters without remembering it is a patriarchal world. It is a patriarchal world. The, the instances of matriarchal uh, understanding of life are very, they are statistic, as they would say on television, they are statistically insignificant. You can pull one out, but it will be standing alone. You cannot fully understand these letters without remembering the existence of slavery. You cannot understand these letters without understanding patronage in the Old Testament world. Uh, and, and yesterday's sermon, uh, or scripture for the sermon, was a great example because Paul was reminding them that he did not accept patronage, that he had worked among them, that they should not accept patronage. And I know that may sound harsh, but um, this was a world where oftentimes that is exactly how people made livings. Uh, what's the biggest problem with patronage? Not everybody's included. Well, that too, but divided loyalties. You know, if I'm subsisting on Bill's patronage, to me, he's God. Mm -hmm. But he's not. <laughs> it's very true. Yeah. And, and, and here's the truth. Um, I saw this cartoon that I showed Christy. I just think it's hilarious because we have a cat. 
Oh um, boy. Yeah. You, you know, know the dog the dog you, looks you at his owner. Get a cat, you don't die. The dog looks at his owner and says, He loves me. Mm. He cares for me. When I'm sick, he takes me to the doctor. He feeds me. And his theological clue, conclusion is he must be God. Mm -hmm. Whereas the cat who has the same owner says, he loves me, <laughs> he cares for me. When I'm sick, he takes me to the doctor. He feeds me. I must be God. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Good analogy. Yeah. yeah. He, he, he yeah. Just, <laughs> it, viewpoint in faith <laughs> is incredibly important. <laughs> and we need, you know, sometimes, I hate to say this, but sometimes we look at our relationship with God and we start thinking more like the cat <laughs> than the dog. Well, that's true. <laughs> and we can't do that. <laughs> you know? All right. Uh, there's a lot of stuff here that we are just not going to look at. Um, we've already talked about the co-senders with Paul's letters. It's important to keep that in mind that not every single thought may have come out of his head, that the letters themselves are probably uh, the work of multiple people from the get-go. Um, you know, Timothy could have been there. And, and when I say a group work, you know, sometimes we're... Uh, when I'm composing, I'm stuck. You know, how do I go forward with this? And uh, then somebody will say, well, what, 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 you could, uh, well, you told that story before about so-and-so. Or, well, what about this scripture? It's amazing how that will shake the cup or whatever, mm -hmm. yeah. and suddenly you have a whole new vein of, of uh, ore to mine that you had not come to your mind. I don't think there's an author out there, I mean, bar and minimum, mm -hmm. that had had to have to co-authorship with other people. Sure, and sure. And you have to be looking, you, you can't always look where you're expecting to find it. A lot of times you have to be looking where you don't think it's gonna be. Nicest compliment uh, Christy ever gave me was we were passing a billboard one day and I said something about it and she goes, you find religion where I don't think it was originally intended. <laughs> <laughs> Paul's letters didn't come together in one afternoon. Nope. Good thing to remember. Teachers and writers carried their own form of notebook, note card, however you want to put it. And as they developed their ideas, they recorded them and refined them. Paul's letters also contain other source material. We feel like he quoted hymns. We feel like he quoted religious sayings of the day. And the funny thing is, when they come up in the scripture, we don't get it. We, we, we um, immediately think, well, gosh, wasn't he clever to come up with that? But the original audience would have said, you know, oh, he's quoting, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. He came up with that brilliant thought of his own, but he's just, he's quoting a hymn that he knows that they know. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's, it's like we talked about rabbis quoting the first verse of a psalm, but by doing that, referencing the whole psalm. And so it, it, it's, it's almost shorthand in a sense. I want you to remember that whole hymn, but to get you to remember that whole hymn, I'm just going to say the first line. Okay, Paul's letters uh, certainly went through multiple drafts. Um, he retained, would have retained personal copies, so he wouldn't have to just memorize all of this. Uh, most of Paul's letters were longer than a typical letter. And the letter carrier plays a key role because you oftentimes did not want someone to show up that they were not familiar with. Um, just like now, you know, it, it, it's one thing to get an endorsement from somebody that nobody's ever heard of before. It's another thing to get an endorsement from somebody that a lot of people know. 
or at least somebody in the church would know. And indeed, we do believe that there were times when Paul used the deliverers of messages to, you know, stay until I have created the response and then you take it back. And so um, that was certainly a, a way of before the thing was even opened up, they would know, oh, he's responding to the message we sent him. Finally, uh, someone pointed out, someone said, is that a woman? And of course, in the early church, the whole time he was saying, you know, women need to know their place, and list their husbands and all that. Women were also a huge part of the early church. Mm -hmm. A huge part. Mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, they were just like anybody else who was part of the downtrodden. And a woman even of, of, of a material substance was still not as well off as her male counterpart. Um, so, um, yes. Yes. Any questions? I know that it feels like we have literally rushed over this, but we're just, we're looking down from an airplane mm -hmm. trying to get a general idea of what the terrain looks like. All righty, well, I appreciate your time and effort in being here. And um, as I was saying yesterday, um, unless something happens over Christmas that really changes my mind, I'm gonna start working on a study of Mark, which will start in January. Uh, it'll be 10 weeks and um, it will be the whole book. We might not read every single word, but we will be doing, you'll have an assigned, you, the first day of the Bible study, you will receive your, um, what do you call that? Their syllabus. assignments, but uh, the, the reading, syllabus, thank you. Yeah, you you'll get your syllabus of Mark uh, so that you can read it at your leisure because I know some weeks you have more time than other oh, weeks. Yeah. What activity to read? Mm -hmm. I had never thought of reading the book through. Oh, okay. I had never. Because I've always studied to teach or studied to attend yes. study. But that's, that, that's the way, if I didn't learn anything, of course, it's been a great study. You've done, you're a fabulous teacher. Thank you. But, oh, the, thank uh, you. but the idea of reading, all just sticking with that. Mm -hmm. Well, reading the Bible through, uh, you know, has. I've done that, but I've never thought of how I was reading it for. Yes. You know, but this is this is uh, very good. Mm -hmm. very good. And, and I know that's more difficult with some books than others because of their length and because of their subject matter. Because their subject matter is not something that is particularly appealing to a right. New Testament Christian. Right. But, um, you know, Everybody that's ever built a house keeps a set of blueprints because you got to know where everything is. That's the truth. Um, and, and you may encounter something on the outside of the wall that is not really a problem on the outside of the wall. It's a problem on the inside of the wall. So you've got to go back to that to fix your understanding before you can deal with what's taking place here. Case in point. Yeah. We bought a house in 2000 out of Kirtland's, and uh, for some reason or other, I got studying the, the water, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the amount of gallons that I'm using per day, this yeah. every week and all that, and uh, we had a sprinkler system that was put in before we bought the house, and I found out that my water bill would not increase at all when I used a sprinkler system. Hmm. So I said, hmm, where's that water coming from? Uh-oh. <laughs> well, I started calling people that had previously lived in a house. Nobody knew squat. And finally, I got a hold of the individual that built the house in the first place. He says, well, <clears throat> there's a little well on your property and nobody knows about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, I didn't hear you. Yeah, had a well dug. And uh, oh. the well was not oh, in the records. Oh, okay. Right. It's still not in the records. How about <laughs> the Trent River? 
Oh, uh, well, it's, it's the water system that's supplying it, yeah. 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 But yeah. The only reason I found it was because I started where the pipes come out of the house. Yeah. And I dug, and I didn't have to dig more than about 30 feet, and I finally found out where the pipe went. Uh. <laughs> we dug the so, well. So now I've got that in the records. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For my records for the house. Yeah. So whoever buys it, you know, house after us. We'll know. We'll know. We know. We'll know yeah. that yeah. there's something out there. Well, we used to water because I had over a hundred rose bushes and my husband was so concerned about the lawn, the lawn. And I thought, what the heck with the lawn? Do the roses. <laughs> yeah. So we dug a well on our property. Sure helped the water bill. Oh. But the electric bill, my husband said, what are we, is everybody drawing electricity from our house. <laughs> the electric bill was like, whoo. Are there any other questions? I thought I heard something. Okay. Well, let's bow our heads for a closing prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for these letters from Paul and other figures of the New Testament. Well, they do help us figure out, Lord, exactly what you were trying to tell us. They give us longer explanations and they bring it into the everyday world. We pray your blessings upon us each time we open one of these letters that we might find the original understanding of it, but also the application to our life today. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm.